All right, with chapter 3 of the book of Ezekiel, we're continuing with this revelation, this calling of Ezekiel to the prophet. Uh, remember, we learned in the last chapter that uh, he was given a scroll. A hand came out and gave him a scroll that was opened up that wasn't a very good scroll as far as positiveness in it. Uh, so we're going to learn more about this today. So verse 1, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, Eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So he, he's got to take this scroll and eat it. Now this is uh, basically he, you know, this is ingesting the word. Internalize the message. Basically is the metaphor here. But he's going to do this. Verse 2, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. Now an important point to talk about, we discussed this last chapter Agency is something that is, is important in this story. So he is being encouraged to use his agency in a certain way. He doesn't have to eat the scroll, but it would be bad if he didn't. So God is being a little insistent with him. Hey, you need to do this. But it's still his ultimate choice to do. And thankfully he does. So realize that we are held responsible for the results of fulfilling or not the assignments that we're given. So that's kind of a good analogy there. Uh, Bruce R. McConkie in his Doctrinal New Testament commentary had something to say about this. He said, John's act of eating a book containing the word of God to him was in keeping with the custom and tradition of ancient Israel. The act signified that he was eating the bread of life, that he was partaking of the good word of God, that he was feasting upon the word of Christ, which was in his mouth sweet as honey, but it made his belly bitter. That is, the judgments and plagues promised those to whom the Lord's word was sent caused him to despair and have sorrow of soul. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That was Psalms 119. Such is the exulting cry of the psalmist, and conversely, how bitter is the penalty for rebellion and disobedience. Ezekiel had a similar experience. He was commanded to eat a roll or book which was in his mouth, as honey for sweetness, but in the writing itself there was lamentations and mourning and woe. So this is, John had a similar experience as Ezekiel, basically of this idea of eating this book, ingesting it, internalizing it. So verse 3, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So internalizing it really well. Get it down deep into you. Get it into your body all the way. So really internalize this message, basically. Uh, and it's, it's he's like, oh, this is actually amazing. It tastes really sweet. It tastes like honey. This is pretty wild. Verse 4, And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. So now that the prophet has internalized the message, it is time to externalize the message, share it with other people, tell them about it. Verse 5, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. So I'm just reminding him, these people will understand you. They get it. There's customs, there's traditions, the same language. So there's not all these other barriers you'd have of going to a foreign country. You're going to your people. Verse 6, not too many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Now that is really interesting, this switch that we're seeing. He's saying, I'm not sending you to a foreign country, which would be hard to deliver it, but they would accept it. I'm sending you to your people, okay, who know the message, but won't accept it. Like he says here in verse 7, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. So they, they understand the message, but they're not going to heed the message. Whereas a foreign country would have a hard time understanding the message, but they would actually accept the message. So that there's that kind of show of a contrast of these people. Verse 8, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their forehead. 
And that might sound strange. Is this, you know, are they going to get into headbutting competitions or something here? So he's made Ezekiel's head harder than everybody else's. Uh, the Old Testament study manual commented on this. It said the words of Ezekiel 3.8 are a Hebrew idiom, suggesting essentially the English idiom face up to it. The Lord promised Ezekiel power, courage, and firmness, since his mission was to a very rebellious and stubborn people. The Lord gives his humble servants sufficient strength to withstand the world's opposition as they seek to do his will. So if you ever get a calling or an assignment that you've got to do something for the kingdom of God, understand that God will help you in accomplishing that. He's going to give you power and strength and opportunities and resources to help you in, in fulfilling your callings and assignments, basically. So that's what that means. It's not a headbutting competition in verse 8. It's a it's that idea of I will be there. So if you think of the idea of the bee, the, the metaphor of the bee from Egypt, you've got you, but then the metaphor of the bee is that other force from God that allows you to take an ordinary and be extraordinary. And that's what he's talking about here, basically, in, in verse 8, is that concept of the bee. So when we look at verse 9, he's going to move on here, and he says, As an adamant, hard adamant, Harder than flint, have I made thy forehead. Okay, this is adamant is a diamond. Uh, if you think of uh, Wolverine, adamantium, super strong metals, basically. I've made that, made, made as an adamant, just like diamond is harder than flint or adamantium, uh, have I made thy forehead. So not just extra hard bone, but like adamantium, like metal, like it's impenetrable. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Verse 10, Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears. So there's an admonition to Ezekiel to, again, put your feeling and your thoughts and ideas into it. Get into this message. Really understand it. Uh, verse 11, go and get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them, thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will fo forbear. So again, there's that agency idea. Go tell my word to them and then they get to choose whether they follow it or not. Verse 12, then the spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. So this is a, this is, we just got, went through transition in his vision. This person he's been working with, this angel that's probably representing God or, or Christ, basically, has been talking with him and encouraging this. He's got the scroll, he ate it. Now the spirit is moving him to somewhere else. And now he's it took him up, like he's being elevated maybe up into the sky uh, kind of, at least that's what he's probably thinking is happening. He's hearing a great voice, like great rushing, basically saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. Uh, so this could be one person with a large booming voice. This could be lots of people blessing the glory of the Lord, basically. Uh, verse 13 I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and a noise of a great rushing. So if you remember in chapter 1 of Ezekiel, he had the vision of those four animals that we talked about that correlate with the animals uh, the, of the book of Revelations. The, so he's now hearing, he's not seeing them, but he's, he's saying, I'm hearing the wings move. I'm hearing the wheels move. So there's motion. There's agency, there's action happening. Verse 14, so the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. So he's being moved as he's going through this. There's heat, there's some intensity to what he's feeling in this. The hand of the Lord was strong on him. He's feeling this intense this feeling that's like super intense on him. Verse 15, Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib, that dwelt by the river Chevar, and sat where they sat, and remained there astonished among them seven days. 
So this could be the Spirit helped move Ezekiel or guided Ezekiel to these people. Could be possibly what's happening here. So this is what's fascinating. So he sat. He didn't teach. He sat. He just hung out. This is really interesting because this is helping us realize that what he, what he was doing is understanding them. He was amazed at how they did things. He's understanding his audience. What's going on with them? So he's not coming to him going, thus saith the Lord, you know, you got to change, you've got to repent and stuff without, without having a context of what these people are like. He's coming into them, observing them, watching them, learning about them before he delivers his message. So verse 16, and it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. So that's watchman is another common term for prophet. We see a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, that's the person that gets up on the tower that can see further out and warn everybody of incoming challenges or problems. He says, therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. So this is getting into the message he wants him to, to teach. Verse 18, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. That is a very important scripture if you are a leader in the church, if you have leadership. So listen to what he's saying here. Again, this is all about agency. Ezekiel has a lot about choice and agency in here. He's saying, look, I'm giving you a message. When I want you to go warn the wicked people, you need to do it. If you do not warn the wicked people, you will be held accountable for their sins. I'll require their blood at your hands. That's leadership. Understand when you have a priesthood responsibility, when you are given leadership, you have that responsibility to deliver the message that God wants you to deliver. Now, I wouldn't say this is a super big deal for, I mean, if you're like, you know, a, an advisor in the Young Men's or like a Relief Society presidency or something, more so probably bishops and stake presidents type idea and general authorities more likely, but I still think there's, there's, we will be held accountable. We will, be, we will have to account for the stewardship we were given. That includes callings as well. I think that'll happen. So your job is to warn them. And just so you know, if you don't warn them, if you choose to not warn them, which is your choice to do, I'm going to hold you accountable for it. So there is an accountability that comes with responsibility. So this is important. I'll bring this Bring the scripture up anytime somebody talks about, oh, we should we should appoint, uh, uh, you know, why can't other people be the bishop? Why, you know, here's here's the thing: if you want to be bishop, even if you even if a woman wants to be bishop, okay, just understand if you are bishop and you do not follow the word of God, you will be held accountable for you'll be responsible for not encouraging people to come back to Christ to warn them of their sins. Do you want that responsibility? Yeah, I don't either. I don't, you know, I'm okay. I'm good. <laughs> that's that's a big that's a big thing. This is leadership. That's a big point of leadership, okay? So verse 19, yet So this is the but. This is the other side of it. If thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So by delivering the message, even if it's unpopular, by delivering the message, you save your soul. You are no longer held responsible for the blood and sins of those people. That is an important point. Wouldn't that be nice to be clean from them? Have their agency not come back negatively on you? That would be good. That would be a good thing. This is super important to look at, okay? In the temple, in LDS temples, uh, this is one of the promised blessings that you get when you go through the temple, is that you can be clean from the blood and sins of this generation. There is a difference between men and women. This is where a big difference comes in. Okay, Women 
men are told through your faithfulness. So if you remain faithful to God, you can be clean from the blood and sins of this generation. You won't be held accountable. Okay, all members of the church as uh, the tribe of Ephraim and those kinds of things have a responsibility to share the gospel and do missionary work with others. If you go to the temple and you do your best to be righteous, you will not be held accountable for what the rest of the world does. If you are female and you go to the temple, you are given clearance. You are not responsible for the blood and sins of the, the, the world, period. Not through your faithfulness. You don't have it. You don't have that. So you have Less accountability, less responsibility, less things you have to worry about. This doesn't apply to you, basically, in, in major leadership stuff, because you are washed clean automatically. That's cool. There's That's a great blessing of the temple. So if you haven't been for a while, that's a good reason to go. If you haven't gone yet, that's a good reason to go right there. So just a little bit of a tidbit there. So let's keep moving forward here. Uh, verse 20, again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, a.k.a. use his agency to not keep the commandments, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sins, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. So this is, again, this idea in, in Hebrew terminology of repeating things. So this is, this is God reiterating this back to Ezekiel going, okay, this guy's good. He was righteous, but then he went wicked. He, he made different choices. And so I'm going to put something in his path that's going to cause him to have a challenge in life, basically have something that he's is going to force him to have to choose. Do you really want to keep going down that path? Or do you want to choose and come back to me? Kind of an idea. That's this idea of a stumbling block. And let's say something happens, the guy dies, okay? Uh, because of his sins, it kind of masks his righteousness. You can't, the, the gospel isn't this, did I do more righteous than sin? You know, oh, every, every sin, I put a mark on the page. Every righteousness, you get a mark on the page. As long as you have more righteous than sin, you're good. No, that's not how it works. If you have righteousness, but then you sin, that sin is covering up the past righteousness. So we need that to switch back to righteousness to cover up those sins and move, move forward with repentance. But he says, if I put the stumbling block out there and you do not warn him, then you're going to be held accountable for him. So that's that reiteration. Verse 21, nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. So if he, if you help him stay righteous, you encourage him and warn him, and then he makes those choices to stay, that's, is good for both of you, basically. Good for both of you. So he's getting these extremes. It, this is, this is, if you go this way, this will be bad for both of you. If you both make bad choices, it's going to go bad for both of you. If you both make good choices, it's going to go really good for you. So he's, he's, he's explaining Ezekiel's agency and the person's agency at the same time basically, by pointing out the two extremes. We can infer the ones in between there, basically. So that's this is really good agency from a leadership standpoint, too. Uh, now, verse 22, And the hand of the Lord was there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. So this is, he's had this revelation. He went to see these people. Okay, the first revelation was like this large one that kind of continued for a while. And then he went and saw this people. And then the Lord's reminding him again, hey, just so you know, you need to teach these people. He, we haven't heard of Ezekiel teaching them yet. Could that be Ezekiel not teaching them? He's not comfortable teaching them? Maybe. Maybe that's what's happened. Uh, and maybe this is the reminder. Just so you know, Ezekiel... If you want to keep going down that road of not not uh, of being afraid of them and not fulfilling your responsibility, this is what's going to happen. Let me let me explain it in, in plain English here for you, kind of an idea. And so now he's got this new revelation we just read in verse twenty-two. Hey, there's the Lord's going. Hey, we need to talk, dude. Go out to the plane so you can kind of go out and be away from everybody. We need to talk. Go out there. 
So verse 23, Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, as the glory which I saw by the river of Chebar, and I fell on my face. So again, he's seen this glory. Now, what, here's what's interesting. He he saw the glory of the Lord by the river Chebar. But if we look in this chapter back up, we don't see that. All we see, if we come back up here, let's see, where did that go? Verse 15, and then I came to the came to them of the captivity that dwelt by the river Chebar. I sat there, they remained, they're astonished among them. So he's telling us in verse 23 that he saw the glory of the Lord at Shabar. He was amazed at these people. He was amazed. There's something there. He felt the spirit there with them. He felt something. It was astonished with them. He hasn't caught, hasn't taught them yet that we know of, but there was something there. So now he's going, oh, I'm out to this plain. I'm seeing the glory of the Lord stood there. So this is like a figure, like God is appearing to him. and He's seeing the glory around him probably not unlike Joseph Smith's first vision type idea. Uh, and he fell on his face, basically, because of this. But he's had something similar happen to him already with his other visions and, and things. Verse 24, Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me. So he feels like this feeling overcome him, the Spirit, and it feels like, oh, I need to stand up. So it helps him to rise up, basically. I set me upon my feet, so stood him up, and spake with me, and said unto me, Go, shut thyself within thine house. So he went out to the plain, see the figure of God out there, and that figure helped him up, basically, and says, Go home, and lock yourself at home, basically. We'll talk there. Verse 25, But thou, O son of man, behold, but, behold, they shall put bands upon thee, and shall bind thee with them, thou shalt and thou shalt not go out among them. Now, here's what's interesting is we we haven't explicitly heard that Ezekiel's been teaching, but it almost sounds like he has been. He just hasn't told us that he has been. Uh, now, here's, here's what's interesting. He's basically hearing, the Old Testament study manual made this comment on verse 25, hearing messages of reproof and warning, the unrighteous rose up against Ezekiel. They sought to quiet his preaching and hinder his work, either by physical binding and confinement, though there is no scripture record that this actually did happen, or by rejecting his message, refusing to listen and seeking to get others to do the same, thus binding Ezekiel's effectiveness. So that's what we're seeing here in verse 25. When you go back, it's going to be... there. You, so he, he went and taught the people. He's been asked to leave. God is telling him, hey, just you know, it's going to get bad. They're going to, they're going to bind you up. So he's now going to go back, basically. Uh, verse 26, And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and thou shalt not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. So he's, oh, he's saying, okay, you're going to go back, but you're not going to give my word anymore. You're going to stop talking to them. Verse 27, But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. So again, you're going to go back. Don't deliver any more message. Just kind of shut up. Go lock yourself in the house. These people are not going to be nice to you. Let's give them a cooling off period. And then you'll go back again and talk with them again, basically. So that's that's what's happening here. That's This is pretty interesting what we're seeing uh, Ezekiel in teaching. The people aren't liking what he's teaching. So think of Jeremiah. If you haven't watched our Jeremiah series, we went through the whole book of Jeremiah uh, recently. That'll give you another good example of the wickedness of these people and how they just they just were so rebellious against the real God. They were worshiping everybody else's gods, but their God, basically. That was their problem. So let's jump over to the next chapter to see what happens more to Ezekiel.